Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to say hello from Boston to everyone, uh, and I'd like to express my sadness to not be, uh, be there with you. But as uh, Andrew said, I have a very good reason for that. Uh, <clears throat> what I'll be talking about is actually a part of my uh, greater ongoing project, which focuses on the ritual of Alevi Bektashi community. I'm trying to do a kind of ritual history. Uh, the predecessors of those rituals, how they evolved and how what do we have today and the functions of these rituals within the Alevi community. As I consider Futuva tradition as a, a predecessor of Alevi Bektashi tradition and the Futuva rituals as well, as predecessor of Alevi Bektashi rituals, uh, I'll discuss in the beginning of my project, I am focused on uh, discussing, uh, dealing with the Futuva rituals. So I'll share with you my uh, preliminary findings in, the, in this project right now. <clears throat> uh, when I look at uh, the general scholarly literature on the subaltern communities in the Islamic world, uh, which uh, seems to me is that the ritual aspects of these communities are being studied uh, relatively uh, underestimated, let me say. Uh, this is vis-a-vis -vis the fact that these communities are actually very obsessed with the ritual, especially the rites of initiation. And they are in their, their daily life, even daily life was a kind, of, are a kind of ritual. So it's a kind of bizarre to underestimate or understudy the ritual aspects of subaltern communities. And I'm trying to uh, contribute to this field. Uh, ritual gatherings occupy a central position in social and religious life of amongst subaltern societies in Islamic world. Among those ritual gatherings, the most important one, no doubt, is rites of initiation. In general, one may postulate that initiation ceremonies are a phenomenon of societies within societies, uh, which means <clears throat> it might either be a stratified society like Hindu society or a marginalized community within a greater hegemonic society. Subaltern societies in the Islamic world should be con counted in the second category. Uh, Bennett Clinton states that Islam in general does not have uh, an equivalent of initiation rites. Nonetheless, this statement is only true if the Sunni orthodoxy is concerned. When it comes to suppressed minority groups, Initiation ceremonies become ubiquitous, almost a common denominator of subaltern societies across the Islamic world. In fact, communal existence of these societies like Alevis, Bektashis, Ehl-i Haq, Nusayri, Kalendari, and even so-called Sunni Sufi orders are, uh, all rest upon their specific initiation rituals. As diffused from and to some extent rejected by the hegemonic social religious order, rites of passage are before all a survival strategy for those subaltern uh, groups. They do not only protect secrets of these communities from non-members, uh, but also articulate values and meanings to legitimize the existence of these marginalized communities vis-a-vis -vis the hegemonic social religious order. These passage rituals have numerous aspects, among which I will mention establishing bonds of membership to the community, structuring the hierarchical order within the community, nurturing values, rules, and collective consciousness of the community, regulating basis of relationship with the surrounding society, and finally serving as worship. My paper today aims to examine ritual gatherings of Futuva groups uh, in the Middle Ages within this perspective. 
As social organizer, ritual gathering of Futuva abiding, Futuva abiding groups uh, were arguably one of the most effective instruments in the medieval Islamic times. Especially when the central political authorities became weak, non-governmental organizations such as Futuva and Sufism assumed primary uh, role in keeping social order in towns. As will be, uh, as I will be showing uh, shortly, uh, the uh, in the case of Futura, there is a correlation between uh, the social structure, social order, and the ritual structure. The role of Futura and Sufi ritual gatherings, which revolve around initiation ceremonies, also have worship aspects. As a matter of fact. In many cases, like Alevis, Bektashis, Ahli Haq, etc., these rites of initiation even replaced the basic worship forms of the Islam, like namaz, uh, hajj, etc. Again, focusing on uh, Futuva abiding groups in medieval Islamic towns, I will argue that initiation ceremonies did not only function as social organizers, but also served as worship. Uh, before going into the details of uh, the future rituals, it will be useful to provide a very brief con historical context. Uh, it is generally accepted since Marshall Hudson's groundbreaking work, The Venture of Islam, that the era from the symbolic end of high caliphate period by the Buyid, uh, Buyid intrusion in the mid uh, 10th century to the rise of the gunpowder empires in the early 16th century was in many aspects a transition in the Islamic world. This half a millennium witnessed a reconfiguration of civilization and emergence of new bases of social order. It was also a period of political uncertainty, heightened sense of crisis, and reshuffling of social religious allegiances. Uh, increasing decentralization across the Islamic world promoted local bonds of social coherence and religious adherences to perpetuate peace and order. As Eric Ohlander has argued recently, the decreasing efficiency of central political power, powers gave way to the widespread acculturation of certain innerworldly modes of religiosity across the central and eastern Islamic lands. By creating a notion of authority and group learning, this kind of religiosity laid the ground for self-assertive communities whom Ohlander calls charismatic communities. Uh, and Futuwa uh, groups were one of the, those char charismatic communities, as Ohlander uh, pointed out. Uh, in all definitions, Futuva is a set of qualities that can be acquired through participation in particular communal practices of hierarchically organized confraternities, which are constituted as communal initiatory groups. As a guide manual rested upon a set of ethical principles for urban associations, Futura provided a blueprint for social organizations as a register for non-governmental corporeal bodies in Islamic urban societies. Futura as a concept of social organization within Islamic context seems to have appeared in the 8th century. Claude Cahan regards Futura as a kind of urban asabiya as a general and fundamental structural element of urban society in the medieval East. In all calculations, from the 8th century onwards, it appears to have been formulated as code of moral behavior according to which urban associations of young people, fit young, had been organized. One of the most crucial turning points in the whole Futuva history was no doubt the Abbasid Caliph al Nasir's incorporation of Futura and Fitian groups into the greater caliphal administrative system. Al Nasir's intervention and reformations eventually created a courtly Futura, which lasted nonetheless only for a few decades, for a Mongol invasion dealt a severe blow to the Nasirian courtly Futura. 
It's only natural to suggest that in the aftermath of breakdown of the caliphate, Futuva tradition did not immediately die off in the Islamic world. True is that the ecumenical Futuva uh, propounded by the caliph came to an end. Nevertheless, the Futuva codes of ethics as a manual of social organizations were reincarnated in various urban associations that we encounter in medieval Islamic cities. Uh, the early sources describing social religious organizations and ritual structures of Futuba groups come from the early 16th century. One of them is Ahmed bin uh, Ilyas al Harputi's Tukfatul Wasaya. Uh, Harputi died in 1225. And this treatise is helpful to understand basic tenets of Futuba teaching and, more importantly, to our purpose the organizational structure of the Fitian community. Uh, Harputi's description is complemented by the Kitab al Futuwa of Ibn Mimar, who died 1244. Uh, the sixth chapter of the letter, the Kitab al Futuwa, which provides us with a unique description of Futuwa terms, is of particular importance to map the social organization and hierarchy of Futuwa communities. So my uh, next uh, upcoming analysis will be based on the information provided by uh, principally these two sources. Uh, when I look at these two sources, uh, the two Futu Vietnamese envision a two-tired Islamic epistemology. First, there is the level of Sharia, uh, which covers all Muslims. For those elects who search more refined religious knowledge, however, there is a second level, that is Futuba or Hakika. Parallel to this twofold epistemology, people are divided into two main groups. One, Fityan, which means members of a Futuba house, and the second, non-initiates or ordinary Muslims. The latter, that is a person who has never been a Feta, who has never been initiated, is called Bikr, virgin or firstborn, for the initiation is regarded a uh, rebirth. Uh, <clears throat> according to Ibn Mimar, the fundamental unit of the Futuva social organization is a hizb, uh, literally translate, if you literally translate, a party. A hizb is composed of fatahs who drink to the same kabir, same leader, elder of the hizb. As you, uh, I'm guessing you are seeing on the uh, figure. Hence, <coughs> uh, Kabir, Kabir is the head of his. Other names used for Kabir. So, Kabir is the head of a uh, his. Sometimes it's called Sheikh, uh, sometimes Mukaddam, Ka'id, etc. The relationship of members of a his with the, their Kabir is uh, like a relationship of son with his father. The parental relationship between Kabir and Rafiq, which is called Nisba, is established during the initiation of the uh, letter uh, and it permeates throughout his life. The main duty of the Kabir is to admonish his Rafiqs, uh, his spiritual sons, to observe the rules of the Futuwa, while the latter's duty is to obey his Kabir's, uh, Kabir unquestionably. It is no exaggeration to say that the whole corporeal body of the Futuwa rests upon the special bond between Kabir and Rafiq. The bond between Kabir and Rafiq is a covenant, uh, it is indivisible and eternal. It puts responsibilities both on the shoulders of Kabir and Rafiq. In the introduction of his work, Ibn Mimar says, the essence of Futuva lies in the covenant between the Kabir and his son. His son. Hence, the dependence and affiliation of an always to his Kabir permeates even after he became a full member of Feta organization. Uh, actually, as you, uh, if you look at the uh, figure on the screen, uh, the entering in the realm of uh, Futuva means 
uh, going into a web of relationships, web of bonds. The most important one of those bonds is uh, <clears throat> the bond between the Rafiq and his Kabir. But he also developed uh, bonds between his uh, fellows, fellow brothers, and also there is an interesting bond between the Jad, the head of the Bayt, as I'll explain shortly. Uh, those refics in the same hizb and equal in rank are called musabin, their brothers, the same uh, members of uh, hizb. As for the relationship between brothers, it is the duty of one brother to another to keep law and friendship, to have good counsel, to support under all circumstances, to revenge, revenge when his brother is offended. Uh, when uh, look at those two sources, it uh, appears that the several Ahsad, the several parties, Hizbs, come together and form Beit, a, ba a house. Uh, a Beit is a corporation of Fityan, which is distinguished from other Fityan groups by its particular opinion or belief. Uh, it is understood from this description that each bait has an exclusive set of beliefs and rules regarding to Futuwe that distinguish it from other baits. By the same token, all members of Ahsab, uh, Hizbs, the parties, within a given bait follow the same Futuwe beliefs and rules. Hence, the difference between Ahsab of the same bait was organized, organization, organizational, but not doctrinal. On the other hand, baits differ from each other, both in administrative and doctrinal terms. Furthermore, the relationship between houses, different houses, was usually governed by animosity, rivalry, and struggle. Uh, it seems that in the eve of Nas El Nasser's initiation, each bait was constituting an independent Futuba corporation. They were bearing distinctive names such as Beit al Khaliliya, Beit al Rakhashiya, etc. There was not a higher recognized authority to regulate relationship between uh, Futuga houses, Beits, hence, no central organization and hierarchy comprising all Futuga corporations. Uh, we have reasons to assume that those Futuga houses were structured according to quarters. Uh, in the cities. And uh, for a member of Futuva Beit, for a member of Futuva House, the ultimate concern seems to be the group interest. They exhibit fanatical devotion to their own particular rights, fight the opponents uh, for protection of their brethren's benefit. It appears that this Futuva Beit assumed full freedom of political and military action whenever central authorities broke down. Uh, when describing events of the year 972, for example, uh, uh, in Baghdad, for example, Ibn Asir records that several Fityan groups, such as Nubuviya and Ayaran, divided up the rule and control of Baghdad between themselves for some time. So this is this was the social organization and the authority structure of the Futuva groups. Within a bait, there was a, their jet at the head of the bait, and within a bait we have several hizbs. Each hizb has its uh, leader uh, under the name of Kabir or Sheikh, and each hizb has uh, fatas as members. Uh, now I would like to turn my attention to the ritual of initiation, and I would like to show how the structure of ritual, initiation rituals, reflect this, this social, social religious organization. Uh, actually, amongst close, close secret societies, rites of initiation usually reflect social structure. This was exactly the case among Futuba groups. According to Hartpurti's Tukvatul Wasaya and Ibn Mimar's Kitab al Futuwa, a general description of the initiation ceremony is as follows. Uh, first of all, the initiation takes place in the Daskara, the specific name of this, the place uh, dedica 
built for those rituals, Taskara, the gathering place of Fatas. The participants of the event are those Fatas uh, already initiated, Nakib as the master of ceremony, Sheikh or Sahib to whom the adept will drink, and finally the adept Rafiq to be initiated. So the rites of initiation is to be accomplished within a hisp. Nonetheless, the leader of the house to which this particular hisp is affiliated uh, may attend as the superior authority. Members of the other parties, other hisps within the same bait may also attend uh, as guests. Uh, Ibn Mimar states that it is custom to have a com communal meal before starting the ceremony. When finishing the meal, uh, Nakib loudly says Alhamdulillah and stands up pronouncing Bismillah, which marks the beginning of the ritual. The Nakib first stands in front of Fatah and reads the Khutbah of Futuba and seven verses from the Quran. Then he invocates names of the Prophet, Ali bin Abu Talib, the Caliph, and the King, Padishah, under whose auspice the Daskara, uh, the ritual, was erected. After these introductory utterances, he pours some salt holding in his right hand into the water holding in his left hand, then shows the novice on his left to attending Fatahs and declares his request to join the companionship of Fityan and to affiliate himself to such and such Kabir as his refik. Then he turns to demand Sheikh Kabir, the, this particular Sheikh, and asks if he accepts this novice as a refik. Upon, upon his acceptance, the Nakib girds the novices raised in the name of the Sheikh and makes him drink salted water, named the drink of consent. This particular uh, salted water is called Shurb al murada the drink of consent. A detail that, is, uh, that Ibn Mimar notes is important. The Nakib makes a note on the girdle while saying, this is the covenant, Acht, of God between you two. It compels you to observe the precepts of Futuwa. Uh, the Shurb is first offered to the Za'im, Jad, the chief of the assembly, and then goes around from higher to lower ranked Fityan. In this occasion, Fityan gather around their Kabirs and drink in their name. In the meantime, Za'im mentions the chain of authority, is not of the Hizb to which the novice is affiliated. Ibn Mimar also records that when the shurb is held in the assembly, uh, Fityan from different hizbs of the bait get in contact with each other and talk to each other. So uh, this is the first uh, stage of the ritual. Ah, I actually forgot. Could you pass to the second figure, please? Yeah. Okay. Okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, so in the second, if you look at the second figure, this the, what I've told, just told, is the uh, intermediary period, the uh, color yellow on the figure. This is the just for, this is just for uh, the first step of initiation reads. Gilding the waist marks the first stage of the initiation, that is the beginning of the probationary period, wherein the candidate is tested on his merits and qualities before his full admittance to Futuba. For a certain amount of time, the Sheikh takes rules of Futuba to the novice and observes his behaviors. If the novice successfully completes a probationary period, another assembly is held to fulfill the second and final phase of the initiation. Uh, so we are again uh, coming to the second gathering of Fatahs, just to uh, make the candidate as full-fledged Fatah. Firstly, the Nakib unties the girdle 
from the waist of the novice. This girdle was uh, fastened before the, uh, in the beginning of the first ritual and asked the assembly if any negative opinion existed. He warns the assembly that if they have any objections or criticisms, they are to put in words now, since a fata cannot think negatively about someone who carries futuva signs, which are girdle, shed, or trousers, sharavan, saravi. And then if there is no objection, the nakib invests the novice with the trousers of the futuva and presents him the drink of pledge, the second drink, shurb al muakhata which marks the accomplishment of the initiation. During these acts, the nakib explains the nature and importance of the bond between the sheikh and the novice. Tukhvatul uh, Vasaya's description leaves no doubt that the Niv initiate is not free within the realm of Futuba, but affiliated to his sheikh, from whom he received the Futuba. Hartburtli also states that a person cannot give Futuba to his biological son, son for Rafiq are considered as spiritual sons of their sheikh. So the initiation ceremony is composed of two main constituents, girding, shad, and investment with futuba trousers. The first ritual marks the beginning of the probationary period, which includes preparation, uh, education, training of the novice to become a proper fatah, as well as testing his ability and cordiality. The second phase of the initiation constitutes the apex of the whole ceremony. It marks the admittance of the novice into the companionship as a full member, which is symbolized in the investment of futuva trousers or saravi. The entire initiation ceremony symbolizes the rebirth of the novice. He dies to commoner life, the level of sharia, and he is born into the realm of futuva or hakika. He dies as the son of his biological uh, father, and he is now born as a spiritual son of his share. Concomitantly, he is now joined to the companionship of his brothers, sharing sufferings and joys of brothers, and forsaking all previous desires and tendencies. Thenceforth, he is bounded by new sets of rules, values and ethics. Uh, so uh, this is the structure, this is how the initiation ritual worked uh, for those futuas and uh, the status within the ritual, uh, ritual, the bonds within the ritual established throughout the ritual are all reflects, as you clearly see, the social structure of the whole community. Now, as a last point, I would like to mention about the worship aspects of this initiation rituals. <clears throat> Rites of initiation did not only govern the social order and hierarchy structure, but also had religious aspects. It was conceived and practiced as a religious act. In this perspective, I argue that Futuba initiation ceremonies were also a form of worship. An overall, overall look at shows that the, uh, one of the major differences between rationalized Islamic orthodoxies, be it Sunni or Shi'i, and subaltern religious traditions, mostly rested upon all its centric doctrines, manifests itself in the concept of worship. Backed with a well-developed juridical discourse, the orthodox view relies on the concept of the one transcendental God, with a vigilant stress on absolute separation between the deity and creatures. Salvation can only be attained through securing the amnesty of God. As a result, the concept of worship, ibadat, revolves around the idea of imploring to God to receive his grace and to spare from his wrath. Subaltern pro traditions, on the other hand, are mostly prone to subsume a continuity of deity from God towards every segment of creatures. 
as opposed to the orthodox view, deity is not confined to one transcendental being, but disseminated throughout the universe. Salvation means to understand and experience the essence of intrinsic bonds between nature, community, uh, person, and deity. Therefore, the very kernel of worship here has nothing to do with the idea of imploring. It is rather perceived as a mean of elevation and purification in consciousness. In this view, worship gears human conscience to further comprehend man's existential relationship with the deity, which also means to merge within the deity. Therefore, worship does not aim securing God's forgiveness, but to fuel human consciousness to discover his own divine substance. Uh, a basic character of worship in the second view is communality, since it is perceived as a means of establishing bonds with the society uh, and even with the deity. The worship here is well-established ritual which can only be performed communally. This is exactly the case among Futuba groups of the Middle Ages. Periodically gatherings of Futuba people in Futuba houses or Daskara were realized as well-defined rituals. I argue that these ritual gatherings must be deemed as a particular type of worship, as sacred history or mythology, an uh, overwhelming religious jargons, invocations, all embedded in the ritual, makes the whole performance as a sacred act. When the uh, social, political, and ideological differentiation between the, a particular subaltern community and the uh, surrounding hegemonic society is not big enough, these particular forms of worships go side by side with the formal Islamic worships. Uh, we can give examples of uh, Sufi orders, Sufi, uh, some Sufi orders, and even Futuwa groups for this category. But when the ideological and social uh, gap between the subaltern community and the hegemonic society or hegemonic social religious order becomes big enough and the antagonism between these two becomes big enough, uh, these risks of initiations simply replace the formal practices for, uh, of worship of Islam, like namaz, hajj, etc. And I think the case of Alevis, Bektashis, Kalendars, and Ahl Haqs, and similar groups can be considered as an example for the second category. Yeah, that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Reza, very much. Uh, questions from the floor? Hello. First of all, uh, Dr. Reza, uh, am I audible to you? Do you hear Sorry? me? Am I, am I audible to you? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I mean, first of all, congratulations. Your words did flew across the Atlantic very well. I mean, it was pretty clean to hear. And then the subject, I'm not sure. Uh, 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 if many of us sitting here were very much conversant with this FETA thing, but for now, um, for me, uh, at least, I'm, I'm immensely benefited. I'm actually a student here in the department. So uh, I thought uh, the very nature of uh, this social phenomenon, though it comes from medieval Iraq and Turkey, uh, could have some impact, or rather some prospect, should I say, in, in, in the discourses uh, in the days to follow. So my question is particularly uh, along these lines. Do you perceive any uh, present implica implications of uh, that so-called medieval phenomenon? In that uh, it is, as you say, it is a, uh, it, it transcends Shia or Sunni thing. So, and again, it relates to the social uh, community bonds and the youth people working with Sufism, if I understood that properly. And, 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 and 
May I just add to that, to my, to my question? Because when we, when, when we hear, uh, hear about Futwa, we are reminded of that Al-Futwa movement early in the 20th century, uh, that young Arab movement in Iraq and, uh, and in Egypt, to which people like Gamal Abdel Nasser or even Saddam Hussein were part of. So it seems like this Futwa thing has you know, traveled across the time. No, now, how do you look at the present prospect, or if, if there <laughs> at all is anything? Thank you. Sorry for the long question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know what to say for the pre today present uh, manifestations of that kind of ethics in the Islamic world. But uh, for the medieval times, it looks like that, to me, at, le at least uh, it looks, looks to me like that uh, the Futuwa principles uh, laid the ground of many uh, differentiated forms of social uh, organizations in urban milieu in the Middle Ages. For example, I, uh, I think they have reasons to believe that even uh, Sufi orders uh, incorporated some things from the Futuva principles, Futuva org especially in terms of social organization, when they uh, were building the tariqa structures in the 13th, 14th century. So, uh, yeah, from the very early uh, times, let's say 7th or 8th centuries on wars in the Islamic uh, world, the urban society uh, used Futuba principles to uh, build non-governmental uh, social corporations. And this ethic, uh, this, the name Futuba and the Fata, and in Anatolia we uh, have Achis, the continuation of Futuba tradition in uh, Anatolia. These terms all uh, sounds positive uh, and, uh, even today. So. Uh, people are, uh, you know, inclined to use these terms in their con uh, contemporary organizations, maybe to uh, increase the legitimacy or to increase the pop popularity of their movement. But uh, I'm not sure how much do they take from the real principles, real, or real organizational principles of the medieval Futuba. Because in the medieval case, the center, at the center, uh, we have the rites of initiation and the closed secret society structure. If you do not have closed, compact secret society structure, and if you do not have rites of initiation, uh, you cannot have a, a full-fledged uh, Futuba tradition. But as I say, uh, Futuba in Turkey, for example, in contemporary Turkey, peoples are quite, people likes to use Ahis and identify themselves uh, with Ahis because the, the term sounds positive and sympathetic. In that sense, in Iraq, uh, uh, Egypt, and other parts of Islamic world in the 19th and 20th century, many peoples use these terms and maybe try to identify somehow themselves with the Futuva groups or Futuva tradition. But in reality, if, as I said, if you don't have a secret closed society and if you don't have a working rites of initiation, you, do, you cannot have real Futuva structure. Thank you very much. Other questions? Lloyd, hold on. Hello, Reza. Uh, hello. Two, two questions for you. The first, the first question is, are you getting enough sleep? Yeah, yeah, fortunately, yes. Uh, we do not have great problem to, uh, nowadays. Good. Yeah, fortunately. Okay. Uh, the second question is more serious, and um, it, it involves the initiation rites. And in particular, by the 13th and 14th century, it develops so that the, the fatals are drinking salt water. And as you probably know, there are some critics of the tradition, like uh, Ibn Jawzi, Ibn Taymiyyah, and Ibn Bigdin. And they are really ve vehement about their opposition, especially about drinking salt water. They say it's an innovation. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder to what extent 
I mean, this is pure speculation, but I wonder if you can share your thoughts about this. Where did this begin? What is the origin of this drinking salt water? Do you think in any way it's perhaps inspired by maybe parallels with Christians drinking wine? I mean, I ask this simply because, at, I mean, football really takes off at the time of the Crusades. So there's, there's a possibility, there's a, a large degree of knowledge among Muslims about what Christians are doing. So I was wondering what, yeah. what, what your thoughts were. Uh, uh, to admit, I, I'm not very well versed with the historical background of those Futuba traditions. I mean, the earlier periods in the before 8th century, what was the roots of Futuba tradition. But I, I can say that the, the, the phenomenon is universal. If you have stratified society or if you have an isolated society, you have initiation. And if you have initiation, you have some marks, some specific acts, uh, which appears mostly drinking something and doing something, uh, which marks the passage from one stage to another stage. So uh, the, the structure is universal. We see the same thing in Hindu society. We see the same in uh, in Mitraic societies, but if we talk about the specifically salted water, why, uh, for example, the honey water, but salted water, why uh, not the uh, wine, but the salted water, I do not have a, an answer yet for this. Why did they choose to drink uh, salted water as a mark of passage from one stage to another. Uh, uh, it's, it might be a reason. Uh, yeah, you're, uh, it's, the time is very, uh, you know, uh, we need to look at the Christian counterparts because as you say, it ha all happens during the Crusader times and interactions, social, cultural interactions uh, can only be expected. One reason might be that, Christian background, but uh, we don't have uh, specific, you know, concrete uh, evidence for that either. Okay, we have time for three quick questions. Robert's first. Mine is a specific question. You say several times that this is a closed secret society. How appropriate is it for members of the society to wear girdle, cap, or trousers in public? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in public, in uh, let's say in a, in a specific towns of medieval Anatolia, uh, everybody knows a specific person belongs to Ahi organization. Futuva, Ahi, Futuva, the same thing. Organization. Everybody knows that. But what everybody does not know is what's happening inside the community. What's the, their rich, how is their rituals, what they talk uh, about within the, the communal gatherings. So uh, outwardly, of course, the members of the community are known. They do not... Uh, disguise themselves, but uh, the dynamics of relationship within the community is secret. And they have some secret maxims, they have some secret teachings, and they, they, are, they were eager to keep those uh, information, those knowledge secret to the outer world. In that sense, they were secret. But the, they were not hiding themselves from the community because being Ahi, being Fufata was something prestigious in the middle medieval ages, not something uh, to be ashamed of. Okay, we have two quick questions. Alexei? Yeah. Hello, nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, nice to meet you. Could the member, the Futuva members, belong to different Futuva houses? No, that's, that's strictly, strictly forbidden. And you can only uh, have one single bond with a single kabir, sheikh. And there is another bond between this sheikh and the jet, the head of the bait. 
So you cannot have two different bonds. Okay, uh, a, a quick comment and, and a quick question. So uh, the, the quick comment back to the salt water thing. Um, if you want to go back to Van Genep and his three-part uh, initiation right thing, the liminal stage always is accompanied by some kind of ordeal, whether it be a large ordeal of separation and you know horrible things, or, or 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 just something unpleasant. Oh, you can't hear me. Or just something unpleasant. So the drinking of salt water could be this. Often there's some unpleasant drink or something like that, or something like that. So drinking salt water is not something you want to do. Um, uh, the other thing, um, uh, uh, the question is um, you haven't talked at all about crafts, craft circles. And um, you know, Kevani has a small section on Futawa in his, in his craft thing, but, but um, that's for a uh, later period. So um, what can you say about the relationship between these circles and, and crafts? Yeah, uh, actually in that presentation, I focused on the uh, earlier Futuva organizations, that says during the Al Nasser's period and a little bit later on that. Uh, if we come uh, closer to our ages, I mean, if we come to the late 13th century and the 14th century, the, the craft aspect gains importance, especially in Anatolia. Those Ahi organizations are, uh, you know, have very strong elements of craftsmanship. Although they were not guilds based on uh, lines of crafts, but the majority of members of those uh, organizations, Ahi corporations, were craftsmen. So uh, the, in the later period, we have. But in that period, in the uh, earlier period, the, uh, I do not reject that uh, the uh, Futuva organizations at the early 13th century in Baghdad, let's say, uh, had members from the crafts, mm. but the, uh, the craftsmanship was not the overwhelming characteristics of those organizations. Mm. When we come to late 13th century in Anatolia, it becomes the overwhelming characteristics of Futuva organizations. And the, there's another uh, dimension, actually, if we come to the later period, which is Sufism. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did not touch upon this topic here, but uh, towards the late 13th century, the structure of ritual and the structure of the social organizations changed. Mm -hmm. In earlier times, we have binary structures, two-folded structures, Sharia and Futuva. In later times, we have uh, three-party structures. And the ritual uh, was reformulated according to this. And we have uh, another actor throughout the ritual. We have three actors now. But uh, this is another issue. Mm. Yeah. Uh, just, you, you might want to, to th can I go? Yeah, just think about um, if you haven't gotten a chance to look at this short verse Futuvat Nalme that is attributed to Atar uh, in the beginning of the 13th century. That um, no, I've seen it. Have yeah. you seen that? Yeah, it, it seems to me that that there's a thread of uh, interest in craft there too. Um, just something to think about. You mean, uh, what do you mean by uh, thread of craft? I mean, it, it seems to be, you know, not a major piece in that Futuat Nome, but, but the, um, the importance of, of, of the craft. I mean, Ataro himself is, is a perfumer. Yeah. So, Actually, there's, there, there's a literature on that, and uh, uh, the majority of scholars uh, believes in that or argues that the Ahi organizations or Futuva organizations uh, in the 13th, late 13th and 14th century uh, were not uh, aligned uh, along the lines of crafts. That makes sense, yes. And yes. I, I share this idea. But uh, again, the majority of members, since this was an urban phenomenon, the majority of members were coming from uh, several crafts. Terrific. Okay. And, and with that, Reza, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Early morning uh, still, or not quite noon, well, 1230 in Boston.
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just waking up, as I recall, having lived in that area of, of the country many years ago. Just, you know, Saturday, uh, very relaxed in Boston. Um, I want to thank you for that. I want to thank those people who are online and thank people here uh, this evening. I think we'll wrap up.